Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If I've learned anything from watching politics up close these last 10 years in DC, perhaps it's this. If you don't like a question, Reject the premise. Answer the question you want to be asked. We've all seen it. This isn't just about spin, though. Sometimes we can't answer a question as it's asked because it rests on faulty assumptions. Take today's Old Testament reading from Micah. It starts with a string of questions, all boiling down to some version of what do I owe? We've inherited this idea that God is some kind of cosmic accountant, tallying our wrongs, and that each sin we commit puts us in God's debt. The speaker is asking how to get out of the hole. And if you'll notice, Micah does not answer the question on its own terms. His response has nothing to do with bargaining or buying God off with sacrifice. He talks about what is good instead, what our creator requires, regardless of what we've done or left undone. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. You'll hear this phrase a lot in the next five weeks. For the month of October, we have taken the recommendation of Bishop Marianne and other dioceses across the country, and we're focusing on what these words mean, not just here in church, but out there in the Monday to Saturday world. The goal is to help us sharpen our vision as we consider our deepest commitments, what matters most to us and why. You'll hear more about kindness and humility in the coming weeks, but today we take on the first part. What does it mean to do justice? First, let's notice what it is not saying. It is not wish for justice. It is not complain about injustice. Doing justice is not virtue signaling. It is not turning every conversation into a battle over who's morally superior. It is not about shrill, self-righteous grandstanding on social media. We trivialize the word justice when we hurl it as a talking point. It might be easier to talk about what doing justice is not than to describe what it is. In the Bible, anyway, most references to human justice have to do with the poor and the vulnerable. We hear a lot about justice for the orphan and the widow, about not trampling the needy at the gate. Sometimes it's about not taking bribes, or in other words, keeping our dealings honest and above board regardless of income level. Actions still have consequences, of course. Sometimes there are debts we need to repay to other people. But doing justice involves recognizing the equal humanity in the inherent dignity of every other person and using our power and our influence to make sure that their rights are protected too. Doing justice is just that, it's doing. It's sharing resources, it's sharing power, it's sharing the stage. Unless we think these priorities got lost somewhere between the Old and New Testaments, Jesus makes his own position clear in today's gospel reading. We're not sure if he was assigned the passage he reads here from Isaiah or if he picked it himself. His response, though, makes it clear that he is claiming the speaker's mission as his own. He too is about bringing good news 
to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. He's about freedom for the oppressed. Or as the King James Version puts it, setting at liberty them that are bruised. And lest we're tempted to reduce this lofty language to metaphor, he goes on. He says that he is here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is not pious grace talk. He's referring to the ancient Israelite concept of jubilee. Whether or not it was ever fully practiced, the idea itself is quite radical. Every 50 years, during the year of the Lord's favor, all who were enslaved or indentured were to be freed. Debts were to be canceled. Any land stolen or sold off in desperation was to be given back to its original owners. No wonder his listeners tried to throw him off a cliff. They're amazed at his teaching, and they're happy to hear it as long as it means only them. When Jesus extends that freedom to Gentiles, as he does in the verses that follow, that is when they turn on him. So then, what might doing justice look like today? Perhaps it is less about what we owe God as compensation for our sins and more about what we owe the world. We owe God something, of course. <laughs> we owe our obedience, and that is where doing justice starts. God has every right to require something of us. But the motive here is not guilt, despite all the things we rightly feel guilt for. The motive is gratitude. As long as we're occupied with our own moral bookkeeping, it's still about us. And doing justice is not about clearing our consciences. It's doing what's right because it's right. And since doing justice involves sharing what we have and putting our own power and influence in service to other people, then we best consider what we give to and why. In the coming weeks, you will be invited to consider your financial commitment to the church. And I hope that you will make that decision and every financial decision for that matter in light of what it means to be just. We give our money, we give our time, we give our energy to places that reflect our values where our efforts to respect the dignity of every human being are magnified, if only for the fact that we're not doing it alone, and where our vision is sharpened for what truly matters. In the silence that follows, I invite you to think about the relationship between justice and generosity in your own life. How can our giving reflect what is just? How can our works reflect what is just? In the name of the one who cannot be bought off and who still calls us to give anyway. Amen.